much, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so just like Sarah said, um, recording notice, this is being recorded. So if you're not comfortable with that, please log off and we can send you the recording. Um, so tonight I'm going to focus on trees for the home landscape and preparing for the periodical cicadas. Uh, my name is Mariah Dean. I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator for the University of Maryland extension. Um, let me see, I've got a wide floating panel. Oh. There we go. Um, and oh, lost my video. Let's see. Sorry, everyone. There we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so the Master Gardener program is a part of the University of Maryland Extension, which falls under the statewide University of Maryland Extension. We have an office in each county in Maryland and Baltimore City. We are under the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, which makes sense why we're in every county because we want to reach out to all the different agricultural areas throughout the state. Um, there's extension services across the country. Uh, it's a really great way to extend out to residents and give them uh, a lot of extend, like a lot of research at universities is doing to a lot of the general public. And we are a part of the University of Maryland. So the Master Gardener program does a lot of different things. We have the Ask a Master Gardener plant clinics, which we'll be having one online in about two weeks. Hope you can join. Uh, if you can't, still feel free to submit questions and I'll answer them and you can watch the recording or however. Uh, we have the Grow It, Eat It program, which teaches people how to grow and then eventually eat their own food. It's really good for food production. Uh, we also have the Baywise program, which teaches residents how to garden in their homes and business landscapes in a way that is less damaging to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and then we also have the pollinator program, which is really great. It teaches people all about different pollinators and what to grow in order to attract them and how to keep them healthy. Uh, we have composting, which teaches people how to compost. We also do a little bit of vermicomposting, which I'm trying to learn more about because that's fun. It's like composting with worms. Uh, we also have native plants, so we'll teach you all about native plants and how to grow them. So some statewide resources that are available online, which are really good to access right now, are the Home and Garden Information Center. The website has a lot of information about all things gardening. The Ask Maryland experts, ask an expert is also there. It's really great. If you have any gardening questions, you can email them and they'll email you back with the expert answer. Uh, we also have the Maryland Grows blog, which is really good for figuring out how to grow different things. It's really good for vegetables and any fruit production. Uh, then we also have local programs like this. And then normally we're at we have booths at like the farmer's markets, the county fair, uh, which they're not having this year, but they're having the food truck festival at the fairgrounds next weekend instead of the normal fair. Um, we go to the annual Earth Day, uh, local schools. We, we do a lot of local stuff. It's, we're figuring out how to adjust through COVID. Um, and then as different things open back up, figuring out how to coordinate with everyone. Uh, we also have the Master Gardener Handbook, which is a wealth of information. So on to the trees. So trees are great. They provide a lot of things for us in our home landscapes. They can provide shade. They provide a lot of interest. Like this is a picture of a beautiful red maple. So it's beautiful fall foliage. It's nice in the summer. We can see a lot of birds going in. So that's really good for wildlife habitat. Uh, maybe some bugs are there. Uh, a lot of memories, like there's trees that we all, I think, remember, like maybe it's at a school 
people used to gather around the tree or grandparents or just a nice tree at a park that we really like, like the cherry blossoms. Um, those are very nice. Uh, and fall is an excellent time to plant trees. So in the summer and spring, a tree's energy will go towards creating like leaves and nuts and berries and all of those things. Um, but in the fall, plant energies go towards the roots. So this is a great time to plant trees because instead of the trees like being put in this new hole and then immediately having to grow all these leaves and these fruit and these trees, they'll put, be put in this hole and then they'll just establish roots. Um, so it can be really good for the trees. Some trees are better planted in the spring, some are better planted in the fall, uh, but it usually ends up being a little bit less maintenance after initial planting because they are better established. Um, and when you plant a new tree, you want to water the initial two to three years after planting. So if you go out and plant a tree tomorrow, if we don't get rain for like the next two weeks, you want to water at least once a week. Two if it's really hot, you know, or more, depending on the moisture of the soil. Um, and you want to keep watering until like the ground freezes. Uh, so that'll be like mid-November or so, it depends. Um, so, you know, saying like, go big or go home. Well, when it comes to trees, uh, you don't necessarily want to go big next to your home. You want to protect your home. So larger trees should be placed well away from your house and other structures like power lines, sidewalks, and anything else like garages, sheds. Uh, you plant them near your home, like your house, you can fall on your house. Um, you plant them near sidewalks, the roots can grow under the sidewalk and then push them up. If you plant them near power lines, they can grow in it and just disrupt it um, and all those sorts of things. And if you plant the tree too close to your house, it won't grow well because the roots won't have enough space to grow out and go. You want to give the roots plenty of room to grow. Um, so you want to plant trees at least 15 to 20 feet away from your house. Um, smaller trees can be planted a little bit closer, but 15 to 20 is still a really good guideline. So that way uh, it's for your safety and the trees help. Um, and Trees falling on houses can account for more than one billion in property damage each year, according to the National Storm Damage Center. So it's really a common occurrence, like branches and all sorts of things. Um, and one thing that you can do besides planting large trees well away from your house is take really good care of your trees. You wanna trim tree branches, make sure the trees don't have diseases. Um, if your tree has like a broken limb, it looks like it's gonna fall, it's gonna be cheaper to call an arborist to come cut it down instead of pay the roofing repairs or injuries if someone gets hurt. So make sure you take good care of your trees. They do a lot for us and we wanna make sure that we take good care of them and all of that. Uh, so research is really key. Um, when you're going to pick a tree for your home landscape, it's really good to like make a list of things you want. Like if you want like really pretty flowers, if you want a shade tree, if you want really yellow fall foliage, if you want red fall foliage, if you want berries, if you want like no berries at all, if you want um, evergreen, deciduous, um, write all those things down and then um, if there's any trees that you know that you really like, if you really like cherry blossoms, like Google those and then see what the growing requirements are and then see if they'll match your home landscape. And Maryland Department of Natural Resources has a really good uh, tree recommendation list on their website that is really good to check out to see kind of what trees grow really well in Maryland because some trees just don't grow well here. Um, and most of all, have fun. Like it's, it's a lot of fun to shop for trees and then get to smell a lot of pretty flowers and everything. So have fun. Um, and so trees require maintenance. So larger trees require more skill for maintenance. So if you have a small tree, you can probably prune that yourself. If you have a large tree, it's usually best to call someone who has the equipment and the skills to like prune that. Um, 
And then you want to make sure you prune trees not only to reduce damages, but also to reduce disease so that we keep our trees healthy. Um, and one thing that you really want to avoid when you're planting that all master gardeners are always just like, don't do the mulch volcanoes. So please don't do the mulch volcanoes. That's a mulch volcano is when you plant something and then you, like if this is the plant, this little thing here, like if this is the tree trunk and everybody puts mulch like up to here, don't do that. <laughs> um, it's bad for the tree, so bad for the tree. It doesn't look that good. Um, uh, we prefer the donut. Um, it's much better for the tree health. It looks better. Uh, like with the mulch volcano, it's like you're looking at mulch. Like you want to see the tree, not all the mulch. The mulch is there to prevent, like kind of deter weeds and to add, like it keeps moisture in. So that's why we mulch. Um, and the volcanoes are bad because the trunk can get a lot of moisture around it and that excess moisture can cause like fungal diseases and other diseases is bad for the tree. And then you can also see uh, when you do that, the tree can grow really shallow roots near the surface of the soil, which means the tree's getting less nutrients and it's more likely to topple over. So if we don't like mulch volcanoes. Please don't do those and please discourage everyone <laughs> from doing this, please. That's, that's good to do. Um, okay, so how to plant trees and where? So it really depends on the tree. There's a lot of different trees out there. So some of the things you wanna look at are sunlight, drainage of soil, soil type, visibility. Like, do you wanna see this magnolia from your living room, your dining room, your bedroom? Like those sorts of things. Like when you get out of the drive, like when you get out of your car, like, so those sorts of things. You wanna think about if you want shade in some parts of your yard. You wanna think about other existing structures. If you're gonna plant fruit trees or anything that you're gonna like eat from, it's really good to do a soil test to see first off what nutrients are there so you know what to add so that way you get maximum productivity and also make sure there's no heavy metals in your yard. Um, there's other things to check for. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, one important thing to check for when you're going to plant a tree is the hardiness level. And this is important for all plants. So some plants can do well as like kind of annuals because they're really warm. Um, they're, or they're used to growing in warm or really cold conditions, but they don't do well here. I don't know if you can see, but we are zone 7A here. Um, so you want to select trees, oops, you want to select trees that do well for our hardiness zone. If you plant like, you go out and spend hundreds of dollars on this tropical tree that dies as soon as we get a frost. If you want to do that, you can do that, but if you don't want to do that, check your hardiness levels um, of the trees. Uh, so you want to make sure that you know the roots and the soil when you plant your tree. So um, the roots, one thing to think about when you're watering is you want to try to water as much of the canopy drip line as you can. And this drip line like when the when it rains, you get the tree, and then all this area, like the you get a lot of water from where all the leaves fall and everything. So that's where a lot of the roots are, and that's where it gets a lot of the nutrients and water. So pretty much where the um, canopy is below that is where most of your root zone is. So you want to water with some of those though. It's hard to reach all of that. But as much as you can, that's really good to do. Um, and when you plant the whole, somebody had a question about this. Their question was, if we have really clay soil, should we leave some of the root ball exposed? No. Um, you want to just, a lot of the plants around, a lot of the trees around here are used to our soils. They'll grow fine. Um, you want to make sure that you, cover the root zone in soil so that way the roots can absorb nutrients. Um, so when you're planting, you want to plant, you want to dig a hole that's twice as wide as the tree and then about the same depth as like the root ball. So if you have a container grown tree, you want to dig it the hole about the same size, same like length. And then you want to plant the tree at the soil line. So like if this is a tree and this is the trunk and then the, like if my fist 
is like the soil and this is where the trunk meets the soil and like if this is the soil line you want it to be like level and there's a really good uh, video on the home and garden information page about how to plant a container grown tree and I really like that I, I'm going to use that in the future they recommend if you're using like the shovel that you're using to dig just lay the shovel across the planting hole and then you can see where your tree is if it's below uh, that shovel which it goes across the soil line you want to add more soil if it's um, above you want to remove some soil so that's a really good way to tell uh, that shovel trick is a really nice one um, so now we can go into some different trees to plant um, so white oaks Quercus alba a uh, Calvert County Master Gardener said they're a tree for your grandkids and local wildlife. Um, they can grow, they can live for over 100 years. So yes, this is a tree for your grandkids. They'll be around for a long time if they're well taken care of. They support hundreds of local wildlife species. Uh, the acorns are a favorite of so many different species and a lot of caterpillars are in the leaves and everything. Um, it's a really great shade tree uh, and it is the state tree of Maryland. Um, another oak is the Quercus rubra, the red oak, um, and oaks are one of those trees that are best planted in the spring. Uh, red oaks get about similar height as white oaks, 50 to 75 foot high and spread. And it can be a little bit hard to tell the difference between a white oak and a red oak, but um, you can see here, this is, the white oak has like smooth lobed leaves and the red oak has like pointier lobes and they have little bristles at the end. They're kind of hard to see in this picture, but there are so many different species of oaks. Um, and there's 21 alone that are native to Maryland. So it's kind of hard to identify them all. So uh, there's some good guides online, but it would be really good to get like a field guide and bring that with you that has like a good key to identify. Um, like this is the chestnut oak, um, but that looks completely different than all the other ones. And then you got the blackjack oak, which also looks completely different, and then the willow oak, which also looks completely different. Uh, so just something to think about. There's oaks are great. There's a lot of them. Um, another really good oh it's happening <laughs> um tree for our area is willow trees there's over 400 species in the genus salix some are native to maryland uh, they're an interesting landscape feature weeping willows are very stunning in the landscape uh, there's also these corkscrew willows which are really cool um of course i like them because my it reminds me of my hair uh, uh they're like willows but they have like little curly leaves there's all different sorts of, there's over 400 species of willows, so uh, they grow really well around here. A lot of them like wet feet, which is perfect for our area since we are so close to the water. These are best planted in the spring, um, and there's all different sizes, like weeping willows can grow around 30 foot with a similar spread, but then there's some smaller willows that only get like 12 to 20 foot tall, so there's a lot of different sizes and varieties of willows. Uh, maples are another really good variety of trees to grow around here. There's over 128 species of acer. Uh, silver maples are very nice. Um, when the leaves blow in the breeze, the undersides have this pretty silver color. Uh, they grow, they can grow really well near water. They're great shade trees. They get huge, like 70 foot tall. Uh, and they're <laughs> the little seed pods are, I always used to call them like helicopters when I was younger. They just kind of like spiral down and everything. Um, the silver ones are very nice. They, I didn't realize how beautiful they were. This picture is amazing. Uh, they have like that nice like silvery sheen to them. They're very pretty. Uh, red maple is a very popular type around here. They get this beautiful red foliage in the fall. And then the, sum, uh, the spring they also get like the red from their flowers and everything. So they're red maples for a reason. Uh, they get 60 to 90 foot tall uh, and they're a classic tree around here. 
Uh, but there's so many different varieties. I wouldn't limit yourself just the Acer rubrum. There's a lot of different varieties to try. Another good tree, it's a larger tree. These are all larger trees. I'm gonna go into kind of work my way down <laughs> the smaller trees. Um, is the tulip poplar. Uh, they have these beautiful little tulip flowers, which is how I kind of got the name tulip poplar. Um, they have a lot of wildlife value. They get big, um, like 70 to 90 foot tall. Some of them have been recorded up to 200 feet tall. Um, so don't plant this if you have a small yard. Uh, and I thought this was really cute. I saw this on, I think it was a Maryland Grows blog. Um, the little leaves look like little cats. You can draw a little cat face on them with little ears and the whiskers. I thought that was a really cute way to identify them. Uh, American Elm is another good tree. Uh, they have beautiful fall colors. They have a really pretty vase shape which makes it really easy to walk by. So they're really good for near walkways. They have a lot of them at Penn State, um, which is where these pictures um, here are from. Um, they get pretty tall, 60 to 80 foot tall. They are having some bouts with Dutch elm disease, uh, which is something to look out for. They're spread by these Dutch elm beetles um, or elm bark beetles. So, if you do plant these, just kind of keep an eye on them. Look for dying leaves or anything like that. If you see any, just let someone know at the extension or uh, Maryland Department of Environment. Um, let, let us know so we know um, we can figure out how to handle it. Um, sweet gum is another really good tree around here. Uh, it gets 60 to 100 foot tall. They're best planted in the spring. They have these really pretty star-shaped leaves. Um, I used to love those so much when I was younger. Um, I also really love the gumballs because you just like spin them around and then fling them. Uh, those are really fun, but I think my dad hated them in the lawn there. But um, they got this really beautiful red fall foliage. So those are nice. Um, American Arborvitae is a really good tree. Um, it's really good for privacy screening. It's a great alternative to Leland Cypress, which tends to have a lot of issues in our area. Um, it gets like similar height and width as that. And it's really great for privacy screens. Um, but if you do a privacy screen, you don't want to do what they did in this picture um, and plant all of the same type of tree because just like with the Dutch elm, um, disease and elms. If like one tree gets sick, then your chances of all of your trees getting sick, like a disease are higher. And then if you get a disease, it'll wipe out all of your trees. So you don't want to do like a monoculture of a privacy hedge because if one of them gets a disease, then there goes your privacy hedge. So you want to do a diversity. So and doing a diversity is also really good for like wildlife and it's, it's fun. Like if you want to have evergreens, if you plant some of the and you plant, um, say, some hollies, maybe some firs, and you have a nice wreath, it's not all the same. <laughs> um, and then it also adds more wildlife value that way. Um, the American Arborvitae, the seeds are a favorite of the pine siskin. So um, planting different trees will attract different wildlife species to your yard. Uh, so Yep, they're really great and they're also native, so that's good. Um, and speaking of the holly, the holly Ilex opaca is another great tree for our area. Uh, they do get pointy little leaves, so don't plant them near uh, where you're going to be walking unless you want to <laughs> like deter people. And that's a good tree to deter people, which is probably really good for a privacy hedge. Uh, great for Christmas decorations. They're native evergreen. They provide necessary winter shelter for our songbirds. In the winter time, uh, birds can have a hard time finding places to like roost and everything. So this is, these are a really good way for them to find somewhere to go to escape the snow. Only the female trees produce the red berries. So if you want the red berries, the best thing to do is to buy your holly trees when they're blooming so that way like in the spring so you can see or ask someone at the nursery who can tell you whether the plant is male or female. Magnolias are another really good group of trees. 
um, with a lot of different options for you to pick some out to plant around here. One of the most common is the southern magnolia, but those get pretty big. So um, if you want to plant a smaller one, there's the little globe, which is like a miniature variety of the southern magnolia. It still has these pretty leaves, even though they're a little bit smaller, um, and the red berries and the flowers, and they bloom the same time. They're just smaller. Um, these are best planted in the spring. They'll flower May to June, and then sometimes in the summer, the, the blooms throughout the summer aren't as prolific. Um, they get these nice leather leaves that are some people use for Christmas decorations. Um, we also have a native magnolia called the Sweet Bay Magnolia. They get little white flowers that smell very sweet. Um, they get 20 to 30 foot tall. They do really well if you have a moist area in your yard um, where like nothing else will grow. They love wet feet. They will do excellently there. Um, they also get these little red berries and they're semi evergreen. So in cool areas, they keep their leaves throughout the winter, but in warm areas, they lose their leaves. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And then there's the first flowering magnolias. There's so many different varieties of these. They're all so beautiful. All of these pictures are from University of Maryland College Parks Arboretum. Um, you can see there's the star magnolia here, there's lily magnolias, there's saucer magnolias. Uh, you can see that the shapes, they're pretty small growing. Um, and the shape is very nice, has these really pretty bark. Um, uh, there's some of the first flowers in spring. Many of them bloom before their leaves even form. Uh, and they're really beautiful. There's a lot of those around. And these are all some of the varieties at University of Maryland College Park campus. Um, so the Eastern Redbud is another really good tree for our area. It's another small growing tree. Uh, it gets the name because in the spring it gets these pretty red but these flower buds, you know, some people say they're more purple. Um, uh, they have like heart-shaped leaves. Uh, they're pretty small trees. They mature at about 20 to 30 foot high and 15 to 35 feet wide. They're native to the Maryland, uh, Eastern USA and Canada. They have the beautiful spring color and they also have a very beautiful fall color. They have the dark red leaves and then they get these interesting seed pods. Uh, elderberries are another good small tree for our area. They get fruit that is edible to us and birds. Um, they're not as tasty raw to us, so it would be good to cook with them, uh, like elderberry jam or syrup, things like that. Uh, they tolerate a wide range of conditions, but they do best, best in full sun and well-drained soil. Um, they have these pretty white flowers on them and they're pretty low growing. Chokeberries, which the name can be a little deceiving, they, they won't choke you, like they won't kill you, but uh, Luke Gustafson, who did a presentation to them, make your mouth pucker. <laughs> um, they have like that astringent taste to them. So they're another one like the elderberries. It's better to cook them in like jams or jellies instead of just eating them raw. They are also U.S. native. Their flowers smell so sweet in the spring. They're really cute and dainty. Um, and there's most typically there's the red and then the black varieties. Um, so, and then there's pawpaws, which are great trees. They're very low growing, like understory or mid-story trees. They're the largest native fruits in North America. Uh, they're delicious. I think that they're really good. I've given them to some people like, oh, you want to try this pawpaw? I'm like, yeah, sure. And like, Bleh. <laughs> um, but I think that they taste kind of like a banana and a pear and like a mango put together. They have a real custardy texture. 
Um, I like them, but other people don't. You can bake with them. Um, they're pretty good. Uh, so if you plant these in your yard, you don't want to plant them real close to like any windows or anything. They get these little like red flowers on them. And it's not like a type of tree that like you walk by and it'll just overwhelm you with the smell of the flowers, but the flowers do smell like rotting meat. So I would plant those away from your house. <laughs> Whenever I see them growing, they're usually like on the edge of forests. That's where I've seen them growing the best. So that's what I recommend. Like if you have some woods in your backyard, like plant them along the edge, they'll do really great. Uh, and they aren't self-fertile. So if you want fruit, make sure you get at least two trees. Um, and leaves are very beautiful. They're kind of tropical looking. Like they're very long and a little bit narrow. Um, so they're, they're fun to have. Um, service berries are another very good small native tree for our area. Uh, they're very attractive to birds. They get these pretty white flowers and the red berries. Uh, if you want to see one in person, they have one, maybe more than one, I'm honestly not sure, at the Leonardtown Wharf. Um, they're also known as shad bush because it, when they bloom, you know, the shad is back in the river. Um, there's also fringe tree, which is also at the Leonardtown Wharf. Um, they're called fringe tree because the flowers, like those long white flowers, uh, kind of look like hair um, or maybe a beard. They also go by uh, gray beard, Grayson's gray beard. Uh, so those are fun. They smell so sweet. Uh, they're slow growing and they don't get very big, 12 to 20 foot around here. Some places they grow up to 30 foot, but that's unlikely around here. Um, they are dioecious, just like the holly, so that means the male and the female flowers are on different plants. So if you want to get those pretty uh, purple flowers, you, uh, or the pretty, sorry, pretty purple fruits, uh, you want to have a male and a female plant um, so that you can get those. And the birds love those, so try to have at least two. Okay, so now we're gonna transition to the cicadas. So periodical, periodical cicadas are about to make their appearance. Um, this is the big brood that only comes once every 17 years. Uh, the last time they came out was 2004. They'll just miss us in Southern Maryland. So if you can make a fairly short drive to Central Maryland, um, it, you won't be able to see a brood this big again until another 17 years and it's like the biggest brood. So if you can, I really recommend going out to see them. Um, you can see that brood X is there. Um, you can see where it'll be in Central Maryland and Northern Maryland. It'll really be centralized to the DMV area. Uh, we do have a brood down here. Uh, Professor Mike Raup has claimed it the St. Mary survivors because the brood used to cover a lot of area, but it's been dying out over the past, like, I don't know how long. Um, but we have a small little brood down here uh, in St. Mary's. We'll see them in 2024. Um, so that's, that's when we'll see ours, but ours isn't as big as Brood X. So if you can, and if you want to go see the cicadas, um, I'd drive up to see them. It'll be something to see. Um, don't worry, they're not locusts. <laughs> I know 2020 has been awful, but uh, we're not getting locusts in 2021 or 2020, fingers crossed. Locusts are a different species, um, and they tend to be over in like Africa and South Asia. Um, cicadas are not locusts. Um, they, locusts have chewing mouth parts and they eat plants. Cicadas have sucking mouth parts and they like suck root sap. Um, so they're different. Um, cicadas will not damage our leaves. They might do a little bit of damage to tree stems, especially, uh, smaller tree stems. Um, when the females lay their eggs, they have this ovipositor, and then they 
deposit their eggs into uh, really small branches and doing that can cause some damage to the branches and therefore the trees. Larger well-established trees will be totally okay. Um, they have a little bit of damage but they'll get through. The younger ones will need some protection. Um, so it's kind of to think about and then so you may also be thinking like what do you mean cicadas only come out once every 17 years and then the other brood that comes out every 13 years that we see down here in St. Mary's and other other places see the 13 year broods and the 17 year broods like I hear cicadas every summer when I go outside when it's really hot like those dog days of summer I hear the cicadas like, that's how I think well yeah yeah we have we have annual cicadas so that's what everybody's been hearing this summer and every other summer hopefully. Uh, those come out every year. Um, and they're different species than the periodical cicadas. The easiest way to tell the difference is, well, first off, is it like a 13 or 17 year cycle for them? And then second, because sometimes there can be stragglers that come out early, um, is by looking at the actual cicada. So our annual dog day cicadas are these cicadas down here on the bottom, like the green and black ones. Those are the ones we have every year. And then the periodical ones are like orange and black and like reddish orange. Um, <laughs> they look like something that would crawl out of the ground every 17 years. <laughs> they look kind of more like exotic, whereas the green and black cicadas, like, oh yeah, I've seen those. Those are, yeah. So the cicada life cycle is very interesting. Uh, so they start off by emerging from the ground after being like kind of dormant for however long. Then they come up, they attach to a tree, then they molt from their old casing, and then uh, they'll be like really tender and soft when they come out, kind of, kind of like a soft crab, you know? Um, and then they'll harden, and then, then they'll go up to the tops of the trees, and then they'll sing their songs, and then they'll mate, and then the females will lay eggs, the eggs will hatch, the nymphs will fall from the trees down to the ground, burrow down, and they remain dormant underground and feed on root saps for years until they emerge again. And you may also be asking, like, why do they come out only every 17 years? And, like, this brood X you're saying it's going to be, like, billions of cicadas or millions? Like, why do they do that? It's a, uh, like, survival mechanism. So the current thought is that Kind of like how we do buddy systems, they do like billion systems. Um, it's like they all come out and then a predator can't eat billions of them, so it's a survival mechanism, which is a really cool one. Um, and in order to protect your trees, you should net instead of spray because netting has been proven more effective um, in reducing flagging. Uh, these are two survey result graphs from Professor Michael J. Raup's uh, research. Um, those that were netted had less flags than those that were sprayed with a chemical that has worked for them. Um, and you can see that those that were sprayed still had less than the control, which had neither netting or spraying, but the netted really did better. So, um, netting is the way to go. It's also a little bit cheaper to net. Uh, it costs about $28 to net 10 small trees, um, which in the study they didn't factor in like the cost of the homeowner going to pick up the netting and then transport it and then install it and then remove it. Um, but to have someone come out and like spray your trees costs between $41 and $194 for 10 trees. So it's better to spray and I mean net and then it's also better to net than spray because then we get to keep our cicadas. They only come out once every 13 years. We can just kind of put some net up every 13 years, right? Um, so how to net. The lollipop method is a really good method. Um, it's just like you cover the tree and then you tie something around the bottom of the trunk where the bottom of the net is so that way nothing can go, no insects can go up the trees netting. Um, and when you pick out netting, you want to find some 
that's less than like the holes are less than a quarter inch um and then you don't want to use like mosquito mesh netting because this can cause circulation problems which can lead to disease and it can also be hard for beneficial insects to get to the tree um, so when do you net in 2024 or if you have friends or family or if you live up in central Maryland or somewhere northern Virginia where the uh, cicadas are going to be, um, you want to net early to mid-May when the soil temperatures get to about mid-60s, that's when the cicadas are going to start coming up. Uh, and then you want to take the net off about a month after you start hearing and seeing them, which would be like mid to late July. Um, and as a final uh, piece of information, uh, before you do any planting of trees, you should call Miss Utility to see where wires are in your yard or any other things like that that are really important that you don't want to hit with a shovel or whatever else you're using to dig your hole. Um, and they'll help you figure out where everything is so that that doesn't good. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Uh, I hope you learned some stuff. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please email me at mrdean at umd.edu with any questions. We also have a new Facebook page you can follow us at. Um, and we're having a, another uh, event with the library. Um, in about two weeks, we're having Ask a Master Gardener Plant Clinic. So if you have any questions, you can email me those questions and I'll read them. Um, or we can, we might do something a little bit different too. Uh, you can also just attend and ask questions live. Uh, I'll be there to answer any gardening questions. Um, so I saw Becky raised her hand. Um, are there any other questions? I think so. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and Becky, I'll allow you to talk if you want to turn your mic on to ask your question. And you can unmute yourself. Yep, there you got it. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I am, I just didn't know if you might be able to answer something specifically. I have an area of my yard. Um, it's next to my driveway, so it's not a really wide area before it gets to the neighbor's property. But a number of trees have been get, cut down by our neighbors. It's creating a, oh, oh just a real problem with the water um, and so I need something that can absorb a lot of water but I also would like to have it be somewhat of a screen but not completely but it can't be wide enough um, that it's going to really interfere with their yard or our driveway and I would like a native um, so I didn't know if you had any suggestions um, I am not interested in arborvita uh-huh. Um, so I'm trying to think um, off the top of my head. Um, a lot of efforts aren't crazy about wet feet, so I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, mm -hmm. How big is the area? Um, like my, the thought I would have is a Sweet Bay Magnolia. Um, oh. Thick, branchy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to St. Mary's College, but St. Mary's College has like the crescent townhome, so it goes like this, and they have like a sweet bay magnolia in like every little backyard, and that is a way of like kind of blocking people's views because it's really branchy, but it's not so big that like they like fall on the townhouses or cause issues. But they're really branchy. They said they loved wet feet, like you said. Um, yep. It was a native. Yeah, and I was interested in that one. So I'm assuming you have to. Um, prune it early so it's not going to um, be too low or something like that? Um, Maybe not? Yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter too much. Um, they can be a little stemmy at the bottom, like trunky, you know, like multi stems, but for the most part, if you pick one that's like one stem, it should, should do okay. And you, you said that that is like maybe 20 feet wide? Yeah. Um, maybe 25 or so, about that range. 
It's always the, um, the issue of us places out in the country down here in Southern Maryland that you also have to pay attention to your septic field. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely, of course, yeah. Well, you also mentioned um, a little, they, there are smaller willows. I didn't know were there smaller willows that are natives. Yep. Um, trying to think off the top of my head. Weeping willow is good native, but it's, it's huge. Um, <laughs> check something. There's one that it's like, I think I know the answer. Um, let me just check real quick. I'm trying to remember how, hmm, you know, I honestly have to think about that. One thing I, off the top of my head, I thought of was a black willow. Um, I see it can get from the quick Google search. My memory isn't serving me for black willow right now. Um, but it says 10 to 60 foot. So I'm like, oh, uh, but there's yeah. some smaller ones that are good. Um, and there's some willows that are like shrubs. Um, uh -huh. So there's, there's like 400 different <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll research it then. Um, yeah, we had a willow and we had to take it down because of our septic field. It did really well. <laughs> All right, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. And you can email me any questions. Um, if you email me any questions, I can have a little bit more time to research them so be able to answer. Uh, yeah. Good, I will. I do have more questions, um, and I don't want to take up other people's times, but I'm glad to find out who um, is now working in your position. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank <I'm> you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bye. Thank you.